Xpermona MO3 was launched in last week, starting from $16,000. With a price tag like this, it became the most cost-effective EV on the market. Because in this range, Chinese buyers can only get cars like BYD Dolphin or a Funky Cat and MG4 EV, which are not exactly smart. So the MO3 could be a huge deal and a possible game changer. Last time we looked at the exterior and specification of the car. This time let's explore the interior, ride quality, and smart tech to see why this car has the potential to elevate the whole brand. I'm Harris, you're watching my EV. First off, the cabin is extremely minimal, just a steering wheel and a screen, and that's it. Overall, it feels quite nice with no cheap looking plastic. It's actually better than the last gen Tesla Model 3. While it may not match premium brands like Neo and Zeker, the materials used are of close to premium, especially considering the price point. The 15.6 inch center display obviously beyond this price range. It's big, bright, and has a well designed interface, powered by an 8255 chip and a 16 GB RAM. So even there's no button, which I do not like, the smooth, intuitive, and powerful software can make up for the loss. You may notice there's no instrument cluster or head-up display because the display is an $80 option. Yes, this is an old tactic for lowering the starting price, but the optional items are not very expensive. The Tesla Model 3 doesn't have an instrument display either, and aftermarket products cost around $200 to $400. It's all a trade-off. They cut down on less important features to focus more important aspects. For a budget-friendly product like this, giving buyers flexibility in their purchase decisions is a good idea. One of the standout features of Mono MO3 is its cabin space, which even rivals more expensive models. The windscreen and A-pillar are set at 63.4 degree angle. Though very tilted, the headroom is not compromised. When I first set it, I thought to myself the sitting position is better than in my ET5 because the MO3 has a thinner battery, allowing the seat to be lower. But this kind of design can limit the visibility, which is sort of a supercar issue. Moving to the back, I did not notice anything worth noting, which is already a win for a car with this size and price tag because it's not easy for a sleek EV to offer this kind of rear seat. However, it's a shame that there's no center armrest. It would have been better if they offer it as an option too. Moving further to the back comes along a big one, the 621 liter super size boot. Not only is it obviously bigger than the 450 liter one in the ET5 Touring, but it's also bigger than most mid-size SUVs. And if you fold down the rear seat, it expanded to 1603 liters, large enough to fit a 1.8 meter long object. And don't forget, it's a lift back, so the opening is quite big. Honestly, this huge weight in practicality is enough to outshine all the minor issues I found in the car. Another big surprise for me was how good this sound system is. I did not expect it to be this good in a car this cheap. It's a 7.1.4 setup from PSS, which brings a very nice surrounded sound experience. Okay, now let's get to what most people concern about. How does it drive? The power is sufficient. The top spec has a 160 kilowatts, 250 Nm motor, which can propel this fairly light 1.7 ton body to 100 in 7.4 seconds. It's quick enough to overtake on the highway or avoiding accidents. Is the rear torsion beam setup really a deal breaker, you may ask? Well, it depends. As a car enthusiast, I do prefer something sporty and more solid. It's not that premium as multi-link suspension. But then again, I'm not the target customer for this car. For everyday driving, this setup is adequate. Expert tuning well for city streets and highways, so it feels well balanced, not too stiff or soft. And the body roll during cornering is nicely controlled, and I think that's enough. The steering and brake are the same story. They don't feel super great, but they can get the job done rather nicely. The steering ratio is 40.2 to 1, so it can provide agile and responsive handling at low speeds and stability at high speeds. 
The turning radius is only 5.3 meters, so it can make a tighter U-turn in one go. Although the car only has single piston brakes front and rear, the 100 to 1 braking distance is at 35.6 meters, better than most other cars in this class. x prizes itself on its smart technologies, and the Mona M03 is no exception, because it's transitioning to a vision-based only ADAS without relying on expensive hardware like LiDAR sensors or pre-scanned HD maps to achieve self-driving in cities but we'll have to wait and see how good the Accent GP is next year. However, we did use the ACC lane keeping and the auto parking features. It parked itself in several scenarios with just a few maneuvers. It was a smooth sail. Until they want to try something more challenging. And this happened. As for the ACC and lane keeping, it performed not so great, at least not on par with other x cars. The speed and following control were a bit clumsy and hesitant. This may be because the one we drove was a pre-production version. But I believe in x and I'm not the only one. The M03 has already received over 30,000 orders in the first 48 hours, one of which belongs to my colleague. He said it has everything he needs. Affordable, great quality, nice interior, big space, and as a cherry on top, smart tech. But it's a shame that he has to wait a few months to get the max version in 2025. I think that reflects the reasons most buyers choose this car. This sub-22,000 M03 offers customers a ride comparable to its rivals while providing smart features often found in more expensive ones. While it's clear that the M03 has made some compromises to achieve this low price, it hasn't cut corners where it matters the most. The battery, chassis, safety, build quality, and smart features are all up to typical x standard. Considering x has been selling the P7 and G9 in Europe, I suspect the Mona M03 will make its way there in a not-too-distant future.